G'day, fish dwellers. It is fish dwellers, uh, fish men, fish elves, sea dwellers, uh, soul stealers. Uh, it's AOS Coach. I hope you're all kicking ass. It is the Idana Dipkin Show again. I've got two episodes. First off, we had one just recently with uh, Paul Wright, which I thought had some great value. But I wanted to get on John Anderson, a.k.a. Elon Musk, Eel. I love that. Um, and John is a long-time Idana Thipkin player. He is number one on the ITC, and you look at his history, and it's just fish elves, fish elves, fish elves. He's a, he's a lover. He's a lover of so stealing the souls of the mortal realms. So I thought what better way is to get maybe a discussion happening to, one, how are you seeing the book? Two, what does your list look like? And three, maybe bring a different perspective to what I had with, uh, with Paul. Some things you'll probably agree with, some things you'll disagree with, and I think it's great just to get some some ideas, and I might throw it over to John first to kind of introduce himself, but yeah, he's absolutely kicking ass. Like when I looked at his ITC rankings to refresh, where'd you go? Number two at Columbus Brewhammer, three at Cherokee Open, two in Indie Storm, and there's a humble brag. You can see like the little, little mug there. There's a whole bunch of trophies that his missus told him, don't put it on screen. But John, oh, by the way, hello, Michelle. But g'day, welcome, John. Introduce yourself to the internet. Thanks. Um, to anybody that doesn't know, um, uh, my name is John Anderson. Uh, I'm based out of Indianapolis. Um, a club would be uh, Indie Wargaming. Uh, doing really well. Um, the club's definitely growing. I'm really happy to be a part of it. Um, been playing Deepkin for since it dropped, pretty much. That was when I got into Warhammer. Um, really fun. Um, yeah. It's pretty, pretty much pretty basic intro about me. And by the way, what's with the glasses? You, you've got the glasses on. I, either you, uh, your future is so bright with Iden the Dick King, you need to put on the sunglasses, or there's something else going on. No, that's just part of the uh, that's part of the aesthetic. Um, I was actually told um, by another uh, gentleman here in the Midwest that when we start getting into deep rounds, when I get kind of intense at the table and I start staring a hole into people's souls. So I was, I ran out to my car and I grabbed my sunglasses. I put them on. I was like, is this better? He's like, that's fantastic. I was like, sweet. I didn't want to, I didn't want to look at people anyways. So, so sometimes when I, I'll turn my hat backwards. I feel like a little bit like Pokemon where I like, I turn yeah. my hat backwards and I throw my Pokeball or there's a guy in our, uh, the, the two time Australian master Dave Kerr will take off his shoes and do the power stance. It's glorious. Like we oh. all have those little nicks. Like he takes his shoes off. Like I remember commentating with the, um, we we're doing the Australian masters like wrap up and I was doing commentary on, on Twitch and I'm watching him take off his shoes, then do the power stance. Like we've all got those cool things, the sunglasses, the hat backwards, yeah. but we're not here to talk about power stances. We're here to talk about fish elves and the eyes of the kin. Um, sweet book. I really enjoyed this book and it was something that I personally was hoping for that I got sick of elves, uh, of, uh, of eels. What did I say eel? I didn't say elves, I said eels. eels. I was sick of eels, man, because it was defensive eels, offensive eels, defensive eels. It was just 50 shades of eels. And I always wondered, like when I saw that book first drop right at the start, I had this awesome idea of, you know, Reavers running forward under a turtle, then the wave of thralls. And, you know, you get maybe a little bit of an elite eels and maybe there's a shark or two, you know, a couple of cool characters at the back. And you never, ever ever saw that on the table it was just spam really? spam spam and I, when i got this book initially i got really excited because i actually felt for once that it was an encouraging diversity enough about me because i've had a few episodes now how do you see the book and what got you into idk initially and what got you keep going with idk yeah so i guess from the start um so i i got into deepkin um, just as it was launching, I actually came over from Magic the Gathering. Um, my wife and I, we had moved to Memphis, Tennessee, and the magic scene down there was next to non-existent. So I needed something to spend my money and my time on. And so I started bop bopping around the GW site because that's actually um, where they ship out most of the North, North American product at. And um, the one thing that I definitely remember is I walked into the shop and they start they were already like bringing out the deepkin stuff they were putting it on uh putting it on the shelves and i was just like wow this army looks really really sweet and i got the um it was the deep surge rating party box which is just like liquid gold value now if somebody can find one because it's like it's got like two sharks uh, a pack of eels i think a tide caster and some of the marty i mean it's just like it's everything you that, need was, to actually was that the christmas box the big yeah. box yeah yeah yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it was it was the big one. Um, and I remember I, I I got it because I liked like the 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 water, the ocean aesthetic, and I brought it up to the counter. And I was just like, "Hey, I'm gonna get this." And the guy at the front was just like, "Yeah, you and everybody else." And I I had no idea what was going on. And then about three weeks later, I was just like, oh, I'm a filthy meta chaser. All right. I love it. And and, and as a Magic player, what color deck would this be? Like if you're an Iron Leaf player, what color or what combination of colors? Well, I think in in 2.0, and this is actually, you know, that's, that's a really cool thing that we can definitely talk about um, now as well as in a bit. Uh, the deck, the deck. <laughs> tell me your magic player. Tell me your magic player. Uh, the the book itself and lists that you create have really morphed from this just alpha strike. N- not to quote Haywo and just take take all credit from, but it's just like RKO out of nowhere, fighter jet run at you, and we're done in time to go to Chick Fil A for lunch. Um, because that's really what it was. Uh, I mean, you you would genuinely register like a Soul Scryer, Shadow Warriors, Volturnos, and like twenty seven Borsar Guard, and you're just like. GG, you just shake the hand. And you're yeah. just like, it's just like, here, here we come. It was, it was just, it was so much power in such a small footprint of models that you were just able just to push people off the board just on raw stats alone. You didn't have to think. It was just kind of like just push them forward. But that was where you kind of ascended from like just the regular everyday Deepkin pilot to people who would be going X1, XO regularly at events is when you get that kind of power and you start like putting it into, you start honing it, so to say. So I suppose if it was a magic color, I would probably actually say it's colorless because I would say it's affinity because affinity would just run at you with a suited up cranial plating, just give you 10 infect and call it square. So now how has it changed? Yeah, I was gonna say, how's it changed? Because it definitely now it's actually has... much less so. Yeah, mm. it's 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 very much actually kind of so when you just mentioned it just a second ago, you mentioned kind of like a mixed arms um force where you've got like a turtle, you've got your Namardi, you've got your heroes, you've got your sharks. That's actually very much what it is now. Um, and that's a, that's a sign of a well-written book, in my opinion. Um, I do think that cataclysmically at, at that level, the old Deepkin book was very poorly written because you had all these scrolls and it was literally a question of, it, it was it was very much, um, so so like for instance, like when, when we're building decks in magic, we would say like, okay, well, I wanna play this card in my deck. Like, okay, well, cool. What does that do? that's something you're already running. What does it do that that doesn't do better? So like, why, why would you run this instead of what you're already running? And so that was, it was the eel equation. You'd be like, well, I could run a turtle, which I think was like 300 and something points. You'd be like, well, do I want to run 380 points of a turtle or would I rather run 380 points of eels? And the question was, if you were trying to spike a tournament, it was eels. So you would end up inevitably just bounce back to eels. But now, well, gracious, I don't think I've fielded an eel since 3.0 dropped. Honestly, I, I, I just, I, ha- I don't play them. Um, there's, there's different ways for you to draw power out of the tome. And most of them don't actually require you to allocate a lot of resources to midfield. Um, mm-hmm. And if you're not having to allocate resources to midfield, then you're not going to give your, op- your opponents the opportunity to interact with your things. And if you're not giving your opponent the opportunity to interact with your things, that's just inevitably going to be a draw, uh, excuse me, a plus for you. So... I think what's cool as well is that the eels have now started to become what they are in the law. They are very much an elite fighting force, mm-hmm. and it's meant to be the waves of of the soulless thrall yep. reavers. And then it was the elite specialist, and it never felt that way. And I and I think one thing that most excited me, even when they brought in the um, not echoes of the, echoes of the deep, when they first had the preview cards for IDK. You know, getting the two inch range on the thralls. Yes. That was like the, the that was the big game changer for me. And I look at lists on my Discord channel, I look at lists that are coming up in GTs now, and thralls are kicking in. Turtles is still around. I would I thought maybe turtles would be dropped because at 500 points, I thought maybe that was a bridge maybe too far. And I don't know if that's gonna change in the next general's handbook when we move away from a monster meta and maybe a battle line meta. Right. And I don't know really just yet what that's gonna mean. It could be um it could mean battle line status, which in that case is going to mean jack shit. Okay. Or it could, because everything's battle line these days, right? Everyone's finding, you know, the sub faction to build battle line to double reinforce. Or if it's going to be about bodies on the table, and, you know, it might be about, you know, you score a whole bunch of things if you have 10 or more models or however the incentive structure may be, then maybe the turtle will be too expensive at 500. But I thought, 
I thought maybe that was going to be a clincher, but I'm wrong. I think you're right. I think a lot of uh, you're seeing the Eidolons on the table, especially mm -hmm. Magic Eidolon. I think yeah, the Caster Eidolon, yeah. That. It's so good. Like I, I don't, I, I, you only ever see is it is it Storm that's combat? C is Wizard. Yeah. Yep. You always used to see Storm. Storm was just the offensive one when it was on the table. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, the storm storm provided previously. I mean, it was an eighteen inch aura of just flat plus one to wound. I mean, like that was what I took to Columbus was because it was that weird middle time between the old book plus the new scrolls for the new book. And at that point, they had already shown that Namardi Reavers would be at threes and threes. So what I was doing is I would have the turtle. I think I actually had two. I did have two. Um, you'd have one with the mount trait for reverberating carapace, which would give you plus one to hit if they're wholly within the turtle's range. And then you've got the idol on literally just existing. Like he's just got a, like a campfire reading the newspaper. And all of a sudden you've just got like a hundred and something shots at twos and twos rend one for one. And it's just like, it, it doesn't even really, it didn't really matter at that point, like whether mm -hmm. or not the models and the scrolls were objectively good because you had math. Like you just had so many dice, like you're going to fail some saves. Like crack, crack, sure. Cragness is a two plus. That's going to be at a, maybe a double redundant two plus. You're going to roll ones. Like I'm going to throw 120 dice at you. And you're going to roll some ones. Like, that's just, it, it was, it was egregious. And now seeing the changes that they had to the wound auras in the book, um, we are not nearly that potent in the shooting phase, um, which is good because objectively it was degenerate and it was a problem. So I, I remember having a discussion with um, Chris Welfare on the channel when we had the transition going out from two to three. And I, and I got a lot of people that come in for their first thoughts. And I remember Chris talking a lot about, 120 shots or a whole bunch of like industrial shots from the three shot Reva throwing down curse. If you could get curse off to do the mortal wounds. And it was just outrageous. And um, it was that short period of time where you open up the window and you do that, but it's definitely dropped off. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So, sorry, continue. No, that, I was just agreeing with you. Cause it, like, like I said, it was, it, it was just, it was such a problem because previously, of course, they had like the short bows where you would get more shots if you were closer. But then like when they showed the new scrolls, it was like two shots a piece at 18 inches. Like, I mean, good golly, Miss Molly. Like that's just going to like run people down. Yeah. So it got, it got more consistent and less complicated, <sighs> which seems to be the theme of what they're doing is they're removing certain rules off war scrolls, especially like command abilities. And they're building it more into factions and really putting in the power level back into heroes which is interesting because for IDK, your power really isn't in your heroes no. because you don't have the best heroes. You don't have these super, super tank. You've got good heroes. I'm not kind of rubbishing your heroes, but it, it's always been about your troops. IDK, it, all your heroes have mostly been support heroes. You know, yeah, whether it was to extend the charge, whether it was to get off certain things, like you weren't, you weren't Nagash, Archeon, Morathi, no. run forward. No, and that that's and you made a point earlier to say like it's very much like akin to the lore. Like that's that's that fits. Like the the Asharan aren't supposed to be these like taking a, a million damage super wizards like Nagash is. Like they, they are very much secluded. They they lead from the shadows, they lead from the back. And then you have the Akalians, like the the king, for instance, that's just an absolute nuclear bomb right now. But the problem is he doesn't have a ward save. So he's like seven wounds on a three up and you send him in and he'll probably kill whatever he touches. And then you lose your general and you're like, well, crap. Okay, sure. Does that worry you at the moment? Um, and I, I guess, you know, uh, Forgotten Nightmares really protects you a little bit, or at least outside of like mag mortal wounds, if especially ability mortal wounds. Yeah. To, to an extent, yeah. I, it's actually really funny you bring up Forgotten Nightmares because I just played a uh, I played a game with Lumineth this past weekend, and somebody I, I can't remember who it was. They went to they went to shoot my Sentinels, and just with full confidence, it was just like, yeah, the Wardens are closer. And the guy just looked at me, he's like, okay, so what? And I'm like, oh my god, they can shoot whatever they want. And I'm like, oh, this game's weird. And so that was that was kind of jarring to find that out. Um, but to to your point, it's it's not necessarily as much of a question of whether or not forgotten nightmares will protect you because once you expose the King, cause obviously like you have to, like, you're going to have to pop the, uh, the potion of fateful frenzy. You're going to send him in like ready to rock and roll strap, like boots up, just ready to go. But the problem is at that point, if, if you a don't get the double turn or B it's the top of the round and somebody's going to get a priority to go, you're effectively saying like you're presenting your opponent with a trade. And that's kind of how I evaluate 
well, everything. Um, and you can ask the indie guys, they get sick of hearing me talk about it. Like everything is a trade to me. Like I'll trade this phase's activation in this much damage for X, Y, Z. And the thing with the king is in order for him to be at maximum efficiency, you have to set him as the general. And unless you're rolling like a king plus Volturnos as a war master, it's just, it's really tough for me because like the, the trade at that point becomes I'm trading a 250 point model. I'm trading my relic, my command trait, my mount trait that I've all had to register for it. And I'm trading my general for the target. And then at that point, because you, you're not guaranteed you're going to keep him. Like, sure, you can find a sour him and then all defense. Like, yeah, but anybody can do that. Like, that's if everybody can do something, then it doesn't really matter. Can, and, can you give me an example of this? Like, I just want to rewind because it's yeah. a, what you've just said is a really good um, uh, lesson for people to learn, especially if they're newer or they're kind of building their skill up. Yeah. When you talk about trades, because take a step back. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a new, inexperienced learning uh, player. I've, you know, in my mind, I want to kill as many things as possible. I want to score my battles, my, my objectives and my battle tactics. And I, don't, I want to lose as many models as possible, you know, and that's my goal and that's how I'm going to win. Sure. But you raise a really good point, you know, and we talk a lot of things like screens, things with pre-game moves, things that have um, coming in from reserve some of those elements come in for the trade. I want you to break down with a, a bit more of a practical example. What do you mean by trade when it comes to IDK? Yeah. So Deepkin in the previous book, as well as now, is very elite. Um, we are not a hammer in the way, in the sense that like Iron Jaws is, for instance. Iron Jaws will run at you. They will continue to run at you. And they will run at you until you like go to Wendy's for lunch. And that's just what Iron Jaws does. Like when you suit up against double cabbage and a bacon sandwich, everyone knows what that list does. Like that's that's just it. It is what it is. So so just to pause, John means like your um your double more crusher, crush, your more crushers and your gore grunters as an offensive unit are running forward, and their single goal is to smash and bash and do combat, then continue to do combat and do more combat and more combat. That's their goal. They just want to run forward. Yeah. Deepkin don't have, didn't and don't, past and present tense, they don't really have that luxury. Um, uh, a very, when I was getting into the game, um, a very wise man once told me that Deepkin is not, in fact, a hammer. They are, in fact, a scalpel. Um, and it's about how well you can use your scalpel to, you know, bleed your opponent without being too, you know, graphic by any means. Um, that man was Joe Pagano, for the record. Um, so props to Joe. Thanks, man. Appreciate you. Um, and see, that's that's the thing is it's very much so in, in terms of trading. So back, back to your question. So you have to present the question to yourself first and you say, what is my opponent? Rewind. How is my opponent trying to win the game? So we a brief off air. We chatted briefly about like Daughters of Cain, for instance, like Daughters of Cain. That's, has, my, that's my current army. Yep. So they have hyper efficient secondaries. They have very good units. And so the question that you have to say to yourself is not, in fact, and this is, this is a big trap that I do see people getting into. You can't ask yourself, how does Daughters of Cain want to win the, this game? You can't ask yourself that. You have to say, how does my opponent's list of Daughters of Cain want to win this game? Because how bow snakes are going to win the game is not the same as how Sisters of Slaughter and Witch Elves are going to win the game. So if I sleeve up and I'm playing against, say, a stack of melee snakes and some girls and then a cauldron, for instance. So... I have to evaluate that list and say, like, these are the priority targets, not actual priority targets, but these are my, you know, these, these, this is what these I need. Are the, to these, take away. this is the list. I, I need to do three wounds on Marathi each round. Yep. I need to, I need to be taking away uh, the Cauldron of Blood because it has the Crown of Woe that sure. gives them the four up, you know, r r rally. And there's certain things that make the list work, so you yep. prioritize what you want to start doing damage to first. Yep. And so once you establish that pecking order, but for lack of a better term, I'm sure there's a, a much more efficient term to say, but once you establish that pecking order for yourself, excuse me, what you then have to do is say like, how am I going to accomplish that? So am I going to trigger Ironheart of Cain by using my first shooting phase? Am I going to have to involve my charge phase? Am I going to have to involve my combat phase? If you don't have to involve those secondary phases like combat and charging, for instance, and you can do it in the shooting phase, 
then at that point you say, I will trade my round one shooting from X Reavers, because Reavers are what I shoot with mostly. I will trade my first round shooting with X packs of Reavers to trigger Ironheart of Kane, because that is the first step to my goal of making Big Mo go away, because I want Big Mo to go away. So you have to just ask yourself these questions of the list that I bring, like the list that the Deepkin player brings to the tournament. You have to say to yourself, like, how am I going to accomplish each step of the way without over-investing resources? Because if you over-invest resources and you, for instance, like you over-cap on resources, let's say like that, like in World of Warcraft, for instance. Marathi is a good example, actually. Marathi is a really good example, right? Yeah. Like just to, to, just to interrupt for a minute. Sure. Everybody knows that you got to do three wounds to Marathi. And if you can do that consecutively over four turns, both your, your turn and my turn, um, she'll be gone. Okay. So, so if I can do damage in, in magic, th th that's resources that I don't have to spend in shooting. Yep, if, exactly. I, if I don't have damage to do in magic and I move into shooting and let's say I only do two wounds, I either have to A, find another point of damage somewhere, whether it is in combat, or I sacrifice and realize I'm only going to do two, two damage this turn and Marathi will hang around for another turn. Yep. So if I, if I only do two damage to Marathi and then I've got to use the combat phase to do damage, I charge in thralls, eels, whatever it is, right? I do that one damage. I do that one extra piece of damage to Marathi. But what happens At then? What cost? I've, I've got all of these extra attacks that are going to be wasted because she can only take three. Yeah. And in return, Marathi is probably going to carve up the thralls, whatever Absolutely. it is. So the trade for one wound or two wounds probably wasn't worth it. Is that a fair assumption of what you that just said? I couldn't have said it better myself, honestly, coach. So it's that's that's fantastic, perfectly put. And, oh, and see, just, that's just, just for just for anyone who's thinking about this, because you're right. Like IDK is a, a scalpel army, and for me as an opponent, I'm always about look. There's things that are going to happen. I need to understand what's going to happen, where you want to strike, and be able to then protect the things that are going to fight me out of out of damage. So when your eels charge me or your turtles in combat, what's the, my high rend that's going to kill the turtle? And if I need to protect it so that you kill X, then I can come in and I traded defense mm -hmm. with Y offense. Yeah, that's exactly right. And that's in, see, in full circle to the first intro that I got to this, to the tangent, is that the, the problem that Deep can face is that you don't have just a million clan rats on the board that you can make these just very liberal trades. You have to be very meticulous about in what phases you're doing what things. And if, and like in the example you just gave, if you do two damage instead of three in the shooting phase, if she makes some like some nuclear reward saves, for instance, then to, to be completely honest, you don't actually really have the luxury of being able to sacrifice a pack of thralls or a pack of, well, anything really. Cause you're just, you don't, you won't have very many units and yeah. you can't, like you just said, you can't send 130 points to their doom to do one wound to Marathi that is not actually going to kill her. And that's just the, that's just the nature of the beast. So that's a poor trade. It's a poor trade. I'd rather just Marathi suffers two wounds this yep. turn and Leave avoid her. Yeah. And then, you know, cause she can't heal up, but anyway, that's like just an, a practical example of what we mean. Um, that was really good while we're talking weaknesses and I want to bring up the rules in a minute. I want to get your interpretation. Sure. Um, any other weaknesses, like we talked about IDK, they're offensive. There's a gr great abilities. The, the range now is more flexible than it ever has before. What, what do you, what do you suck at? What is, what are you not good at that either as a list builder, you want to either avoid or you maybe you go into like you go into your allies and try to find a, a strength there or um, something that you just need to consider. So I think one thing that definitely it, it rang true in or at home true, excuse me, in 2.0, and it transitioned to a slightly less degree, and we can talk about it in a bit because I know I'm sure we'll we'll get to it. Is that it's just armies that can produce mortal wounds, they'll just they'll they'll rack your army so quick. I mean, we we have some insurance in that our foot heroes now have a five aboard. Fantastic. Excuse me, let me rephrase that. The Asharon have a five aboard. So like your soul render, your tide caster. And you have your soul render, your tide caster. And you misses like your, the thing, they steal the glasses off you. Go on. Yeah. You, mortal, mortal, mortal wounds has always been because as an opponent, I've always wanted to shoot you off the board, right? There's always that, that clutch hero, the Achillean King, Volturnus back in the day, uh, the Soul Scryer. There's always that, you know, that person I just wanted to take out that was a linchpin, but you never could. 
right. and I needed mortal wounds and, and, and mortal wound abilities as well, things that didn't trigger in the shooting phase. Right, and and that's that's the thing is stuff like disciples of Zinch, for instance, like Zinch's firestorm or super smite from Kairos. I mean, it'll just it's it, it can be so rough and. I, it, there's a reason that against like disciples of Zinch, deep can have like a 40% win rate. It there's a, there's a reason for it. It's just that what that army is trying to do is the antithesis to what your army like exists on. So yeah, I, I would say that mortals, especially in the magic phase are the thing that you are just like, here we are. Like we can't, we can't be dodgers of Kane. We can't be good at everything. Yeah. So, so they, I guess the question is then, do you try to find ways around it where you put things into reserve, you know, you, you try to find ward saves so, or do you, do you accept the limitation and just yeah. focus on your strength, which is always a critical part of list building? Yeah, that's, that's actually a fantastic question. So that's, that's something that when, so w when I was playing magic, um, the, the gentleman who ran the store back home in Clarksville's name is Randy Peterson. Um, it's this store here, Frontline Games. When he was teaching us to play competitive magic, he he taught us that you lean into your strengths and that you what you do well, make sure you do it the best. Because the thing is, is that like when you start saying, well, if I'm going to uh, if I have to sacrifice some of my efficiency for rigidity, then you're not going to be doing what you're supposed to be doing as well. And then you're not going to do anything very well. And that's that's kind of the problem. And the, the answer to your question is you just kind of have to understand going into it that there are a few of those lists out there, a few armies that if you just, if you get paired against them, like, I mean, it's, there, there's a way you can beat them, but it's, it's not easy. It's not fun. And you just kind of got to hope that the dice are there for you. Cause, and at the end of it, if the dice weren't, like I said, it's a 40% win rate for a reason, 40, 45, I think like it's, it's, it's there for a reason. So I think the answer to your question is you just have to lean into what your army does well. And that's not even a deepkin thing. That's a, that's a, that's an anything thing. Um, if, yeah. you're, if you're yeah. playing KO, don't, don't try and play like fire slayers, play ironclads, shoot, shoot people. Like, like do what you're, when you build the list, build it to do something well. Don't just build it to be like, yeah, like I, I, I exist. Like, yeah, okay, sure. Like, that's that's fine. It's it's it, it's a good tip, and it's probably why traditionally Deepkin didn't really lean into the magic phase. You saw very little endless spells. You saw very little wizards. You know, the magic magic and and boosting up magic was never really a focus because you weren't really good at that particular thing. But obviously, the Eidolon has gotten a little better. Let's actually talk about list building. Let's actually think about building a list. And when you look at the allegiance abilities, um. What are your thoughts around rituals, forgotten nightmares, the tides of death? You know, anyone who hasn't noticed this just yet and you were a former Deepkin player, the tides of death, you can't flip it nearly as easily as you used to. Um, the rituals got a massive boost, ignoring the fact that you lost the ability to shut off flying. But let's start at the top. Uh, actually, no, we'll ignore enclaves for a second because I will show you enclaves. But what are your thoughts on the rituals? Is this something that you lean into? Do you try to find multiple things that can get you rituals? Is there one that you really like? Yeah, I think, um, so I, I, I don't believe that rituals will be. Um, you getting a lot of, a lot of love in the chat. You're, uh, you're, you're a hero. You're God. a hero to you're, you're, you're a hero of the, of the deep kid. No, I just, I just saw James and that's like, holy cow. Now I'm starstruck. Whoa. Um, all right. Now I gotta we, be on my love, best we, behavior. We, we love James Tinsdale. I, I'm a big fan of James. He's a oh my great, gosh. There's so there's so many great players, but oh gosh, I'm, blushing. I'm gonna get you back focused for a second. Now he's yeah, please. <laughs> um, so you got your, your Ishlan rituals, and I think yes. it's one of the, the big glow ups of Lotan. Glotan yes. was such a big joke of, of Deepkin back in the day. You'd 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 take him because of Oki, the, the octopus, yep. but actually no one ever fielded um Lotan. Back now I got you refocused. Ishran rituals, um, do you take multiple Ishran um, uh, people who can take it, whether it's the, is it the Tidecaster or the, um, yeah, do you take multiple of them? Is it something that you build so around? The, the Tidecaster enables you to take two. Um, normally you would only get one. And I think by and large, you should only ever need one. However, I do think that going into, especially in a GT format, like in a solo queue format, for instance, I think that there is a lot of strength in being able to take two because there are some matchups 
where being able to say in high tide, I want to be able to have a five up board for all my Namarty because during the list building phase, I've leaned into the Namarty strength. And then at the same time say like, and while I'm in cover, I don't want you to be able to shoot me. Like for a, a really good example of a list that you could shut down a lot of their power is for instance, if you have six long strikes and I say, you can't shoot me if you're not within 12, you're going to have a really bad time because now you're having to say, do I want to allocate these long strikes? A, having to shoot something I really don't want to shoot anyways because of forgotten nightmares. But then B, if I do want to shoot because I need to start pulling models off the board very quickly because that, especially that Stormcast list, is not. there's not a lot of bodies in that list. And if you're not going to be able to start racing me to start removing bodies off the board, then you have to say to yourself, like, okay, well, now I'm going to have to, like, be within 12, and I'm going to be in striking distance for all of his stuff. And it's just, it, it could very quickly just turn into an, an absolute just slaughter fest very quickly. And I think because of the fact that you don't have to declare your rituals at, like, the list building phase. Like, that's that's a big thing. And, like, you made a comment just a second ago, and we'll get to it when we get to it, um, about, like, when you're able to select these um, effects. And the fact that the rituals happen right then and in, in the first battle round after they receive their first starting command points like when you have full perfect knowledge of deployments of um positioning everything when you have perfect knowledge at that point you can make your decision and i think that's just such an invaluable tool to have because there are some armies who are saying like you can't shoot me if you're not within 12 like what sentinels aren't going to shoot you that's fantastic. You're still going to be in the fox box. Don't get me wrong. Like you, you will have foxes in your face. But at the same time, like that's 500 and 510 points of plus. plus not well, plus because that people are building, you, you take a hero and you take certain other things to boost that up, right? You know, bow snakes, double, you take Marathis. That's all of a sudden like a thousand points for that type of build. You know, you rock up to the table, you see the long strikes with the holy command, you can kind of ignore that for yeah. a little bit. Uh, your KO, obviously KO aren't strong in the meta right now, but it allows you to confidently rock up to the table and go, look, the way I'm going to have to beat X army is I'm going to need that plus one to my run and charge. I need to be more offensive with my army, or I'm going to need to be able to... Look, you know, Spiteful Riptide is probably not my favorite. You're probably picking from the top three. But yeah. it gives you great flexibility and, and, and the fact that you don't have to choose at list building is powerful. Yeah. And that's, that, that's just a, such a unique ability to have. And when you mentioned Lotan just a second ago, so let's talk about like the Octodad. Um, there is... L L Lotan for anyone who hasn't Lotan. got that yet. Lotan, the yeah. soul war the, a warden of the soul ledgers, I think is his formal title, but beside the point. The, the thing about Lotan, especially now, is that... You so in in the 2.0 book we had kind of a cheesy mechanic where we could give somebody a cloud of midnight. You launch them forward, crack the cloud in their shooting phase. They can't shoot anything past it. You can still technically actually do something like this with Lotan. You give it to a model. You give them the Ritual of the Creeping Mist. You launch that model forward. That model can't be it is the closest, and. It can't be targeted, but it has to be targeted. So it's the same thing with the Cloud of Midnight, except now we're having to allocate like a once per game ability instead of a relic. And it's just, there's there's a few more moving parts that you have to do to it instead of just walk forward, use relic. Um, yeah. The the one thing I will say is that Lotan in the previous, in the previous edition had a very strong presence because he was able to garrison into the boat. And when you garrison, that becomes your footprint. And when you that becomes your footprint, obviously, of course, you can display auras over a much larger range. And to a degree that happens now, there is a discussion whether or not the foot heroes are allowed to garrison into, uh, into the shipwrecks because they have companions. And companions, according to the core rules, are ruled as mounts. And in the Gloomside yeah. Shipwreck, it says that mounted heroes can't get in the shipwreck. It's very clear what the intention mm -hmm. was. It was to stop yeah. Volternos and the king. From yeah, the yeah, yeah. I, I see where it's going. But right. because Oki, the octopus, is a mount, a companion, which is, a companion, which is a mount, then then doesn't mean, yeah, okay. That Strict, sounds like strictly a, a, rules is written. He can't get in the boat. Now, to be fair, I haven't seen a TO that was just like, no, you can't put Lotan in the boat because it's obvious like what the actual intent was. 
And the thing is, is that especially now that he has this plus one to wound, just flat aura for all melee profiles is so strong because like you can put him in this giant boat and all of a sudden, like you've just got like a, a plus one to wound aura that's like this big in your deployment zone. And then you're like, go ahead, come on over. Actually, I'll skip to the boat then. While you're on the tangent of boat, right? Because boat sure. boat has become, we'll go back to the rest of the stuff in a yeah. minute, just while you're on the, the boat tangent, because the boat has become very different as well, right? Yeah. You used to be able to, and like most people just annoyed the shit out of me by putting the boats in my deployment zone. I'll never forget this one particular game where my opponent, Ken, the, the, the jerk, he put two, I'm playing Gloom Spike Gits. I've got like 160 idiots, 100, 200 idiots on the table. And he puts them right in my deployment in one of those little weird box shapes that we had back in the day. Yep. And like, like, and, the, and then because of terrain, and like I had to climb up and like taking 10 years to do anything. It was just yeah. like the worst experience. But you can't do that anymore. Nah. Asked, it, it's it, thankfully, but more importantly, it, it's changed its role to be less offensive because it used to do damage. And most people did it to do some chip mortal wounds to their opponent and just annoy the crap out of them. Now it is more of a defensive play where you get your, your five up ward, as you, you're previously mentioning. How do you look at the boat? Where do you put it? Um, what do you, do you try to hug the terrain to get the ward? What you thinking here? So I, I will go to my grave saying that the measure of a good deep kin pilot in 2.0, as well as now in three is how well they place the boat. Um, when you're in the game and you're moving your models around, you're moving your units, you're into combat, you're shooting, you're, you're bouncing off your opponent. There's like, there's the, the flow of battle, so to speak. The one thing that is not moving, that is constant is where you set the boats. And it's that sense of knowledge of knowing this is where the fights are going to be in three rounds. And then you set the boats accordingly to give yourself one of two things. Um, one, you want them to either provide you the ward save or two, and this is what I've been using them more for personally, is to buy you real estate. So the thing, the thing about the boats is that now that they are garrisonable and defensible, that means you can't land on them. Garrisonable terrain cannot be landed on. So that means that when you take the ship in the bottle artifact, you can set out either one, one giant piece of uninteractable terrain or you can measure off three inches from other terrain pieces and just block up choke points, just like we did in 2.0, to a lesser degree, to a lesser degree. And you buy yourself just this coverage of saying like, well, you can't land there. And so now all of a sudden you've got something like, say, um, well, since we were talking about Daughters of Cain, a cauldron. A cauldron can't walk over the boat. It doesn't have, Unless you give it levitate, it's going to have to go around. And that's the thing is that if you if you actually just set that up in such a way that you can just say this entire channel of terrain, like this entire battle path, you no longer have, you're not, you, you don't have permission to be here anymore. That in and of itself is just such a powerful effect. And it's very, very good, even on the defensive against Alpha Strike armies, for instance, like Iron Jaws. In Iron Jaws, you can set the boat in such a way. And obviously, of course, you like, you have to account for terrain and screens and whatnot. But when you set the boat up in such a way to measure, because obviously, of course, like it's it's open knowledge, you can measure everyone's, um, you can measure everybody's bases, you know how big a, a mall crusher is, you know how big Archaon is, you can measure that and then just say like, okay, well, these boats are going to be like one millimeter in, you can't land here. Mm. And it's just like that in and of itself can just save your life. Because now all of a sudden what Iron Jaws wanting to do is just like try and alpha you off the board, for instance. They no longer can't like they're, they're not allowed to do that like because they're going to say like well i can't land here that means i'm going to have to go over here on the soft side and if they go to the soft side which you knew they were going to have to do by setting that by not allowing them to attack you head on now you can already enact your counter attack plan and you just you already start making dividends and, every, and and people do that that's a really good tip by the way because people are doing that with endless spells as well yeah. where, where while with an endless spell you can move through it you can't yeah, land yeah. on it so if you place, let's say, like some type of wall or some type of even cogs, for example, right in front of your, your model, if you can create like a, shackles is another one, not that you'd probably do it, but it's a great defensive play for something that's charging and, you know, especially a large base or a large footprint, 
um, a, a lot of board control and denial can happen. So, and, and what's interesting as well is that you have the ability, is it a command trait or an artifact? I completely forget where you can get a second boat. It's a relic. So it's, We're room yeah, it's a relic. Blue zone. Yeah. So it's not everybody. It's, it's an optional choice in your list building, but getting a second boat on the table, either get another ward or to block up the board. Um, obviously it helps you score. Is it a battle tactic and a grand strategy as well? There's some things that are tied up to, your boats but you know there's some some good things in there uh, certainly would you take a second boat that would you go warlord would you take your first artifact to get the boat uh, i would definitely the the first relic that i'm usually putting in it's either going to be arcane tomer this um because i don't personally play the the nuclear king um it's just not my style i don't i don't like having to like go to the whole discussion that we had at the outset i don't like having to say like well is this worth my warlord so I, I do prefer to actually have this, but I'll put this, the the Rune of the Surging, I, I refuse to call it the Rune of the Surging Gloom Tide. I call it the ship in a bottle because it sounds much better and it's like- I like it. Yeah. Um, and that's just, it, it is what it is. You can put that on, for instance, like a Soul Render. And with the Soul Render's changes, he's more tanky and he's able to actually interact with the board from just a massive amount of range. So you can just like launch him forward with a teleport with Steed of Tides. And now all of a sudden you can do exactly like what you just said to a Goom Spike Gets player. Like you just, all of a sudden you've got another boat in your face and you're just having 2.0 flashbacks. And it's just such a great relic. Um, for a Warlord Battalion, I think you would probably take like the ship in a bottle and then like Arcane Tome, maybe, I guess. I don't really know. There's there's a few decent relics for the Asheran, um, but by and large, it's shipping a bottle or bust. Yeah. And, you know, like deny trespassers as a battle tactic is a good, easy one. Well, it's, mostly easy. Like it depends, it depends obviously what the opponent is that's within the gloom type shit wreck right. and how much, you know, how much offense you still have in your army, but that's a relatively easy one given that that's your goal. Yeah. The, the grand strategy of at the end of the battle, having nobody near your shipwreck, I do believe that that's plural shipwreck or shipwrecks. And so in that case, I don't believe I would take a second one just because you're giving your opponent more opportunities to deny you your scoring your grand strategy. And as I don't know, it's it's uh, it's, it's it's any any gloom type ship race right. in your army in the battlefield and um, all are of them are more than three inches of enemy units. Right. As callous as this might sound, if my grand strategy was to keep everybody three inches away from my shipwreck. The less that I can let my opponent interact with my stuff, the better. And you know that that might rub some people the wrong way, but honest to goodness, like if if my grand strategy is like keep you away from the boat, I'm not going to bring an an additional one to give you possibly two more pieces that you could just be within three at the end of the game. You're just like no grand strategy, ha ha. And I'm just that's just not how I that's not just not how I like to play. Yeah, yeah, and it'll be interesting to see what the next general's handbook in the next six months, what the battle tactic, what the grand strategies are going to be, and you know, like you know, you look at the battle, uh, the battle tactics and the grand strategies, and often the battle tactic ones are just better. And every book review that I do, you know, nine times out of ten, I'm not picking my book grand strategy, but I know there will come a time where that option will be completely removed from all of us. Maybe it'll be the general's handbook because now we're in a six month cycle. Maybe the next one will have grand strategies while Gloom Spike Gits and other armies all get up to date. Yeah. So don't poo-poo them. I would practice them and kind of think about them. But yeah, at the moment, I probably wouldn't rely on any of these. Um, there are some ones that are easier than others, but I probably still wouldn't be taking any ID, IDK grand strategies yet unless I was forced to. Right. No, I agree. Um, I, I think the one that's... Um... What, what is it like have only Namardi battle line alive? I guess that's just hold the line with more steps, but I guess so. Yeah, I, I do. I do like Dominion of the Deep ones where when the battle, uh, the battle, uh, battle, uh, the battle ends, you complete the grand strategy. If only monsters are on the battlefield that are friendly Levidons. Yeah. Terrible. So if you're running, if you're running, is it Noc Nocta, Nocula, whatever the, the, the turtle build is, if you're running like a whole bunch of turtles, I like that. But for most other it's if you're only running running one turtle <laughs> to kill the turtle and uh your grand strat's gone yep 
Any any thoughts on on the tides of death? Given that that has fundamentally changed because you can't flip it as quick as you used to, your, your rituals do interact with it. Um, how do you play with the tides of death? Are you preparing for it? Because traditionally, most people would either plan for the turn three, just all in, everyone strikes first, or turn two if you used to flip the tide. Mm -hmm. Would you a take your general as I forget what it was that allows you to do to do the flip? Um, or B, are you still reliant, less reliant? Like, how do you look at Tides of Death? So in previously, it was a lot easier for you to capitalize on a turn two high tide because the old Fwethen allegiance ability replaced retreat and charge with run and charge. So you're able to give the turn away top of one and you could still cover the entire board and be set up for a really strong high tide. The, the problem with that is that now when you flip tide, you are in fact in retreat and charge. Now, that being the case, I do still think, and I do still flip the tide pretty commonly, um, because I think that a turn two capability of being able to say, especially in what in such a fighting meta that we're kind of evolving into, like with flies that are just just walking at you, or with pigs, or with maw crushers, or now with daughters of Cain with fighty snakes, when you have the capability to say on turn one, even it's oh man, this is. It's like some like 4D level chess um, that you do because you're you, you're telling your opponent, you're like, okay, you can run at me and you can do your thing. But if you do, I'm going to be able to retreat off and then charge you. Yeah. More importantly, be advised, we're going into high tide next turn. And it's a deterrent more than anything. Because if they do choose to just come at you, you you've prepared yourself. You've got your ward saves with your boat. You've got your retreat and charge ready to go. You're just, you're, you're cocked and locked, ready to rock. And the thing is, if they choose not to, if they choose not to alpha strike you, then for instance, then that has accomplished its goal because now you've said, all right, well now I can walk forward. You come forward. And now we, now we are going into high tide already ready to go. And by saying you either allocate your units into a fight that you are not primarily wanting to do a fight of your choosing, let's say a fight of my opponent's choosing, if they're having a fight on my terms, then I prefer that fight over fighting on their terms. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, because I, I guess I'm thinking of the traditional way that people used to play it. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about this, obviously, from, you know, asking questions and trying to get to the root of this. Traditionally, you would, you would build up your force, you would apply all of the buffs preparing for high tide, and then, you know, you'd want to maximize high tide in your opponent's turn and your turn. And hopefully through the damage cycle, you would do enough attrition that the opponent can't fight back. But what you're saying is that while that's an option, the other option as well as you're, you're using it as a deterrent that they will waste a combat phase and not get in front of you because they're scared of high tide. Um, you're using it as a defense rather than just going completely offensive with it. And obviously that's going to change depending on opponent and battle plan and position, but it's another option for the, to choose from. Right. So options, armies that give options are inherently going to be better armies than armies that don't. And I, and I understand that there are some outliers, of course, like Skaven has a trillion options, but it's probably going to boil down to like nine storm fiends and your name is Anthony Trentinelli. Like that's really what it's probably going to boil down to. The thing is, is that, and it's this is the caveat to the flip tide now in 3.0. The caveat now is that you have to determine whether or not you're going to flip the tide before priority is determined. And previously, you were able to flip tide at the start of the first battle round. So you had knowledge of who's going when. And then you could say, like, well, if it's going to benefit me, I will flip the tide. If it's not, I won't. Now you have to either do one of two things. One, you build your list to make sure that you will be able to determine priority. Or two, you just say, well, I'm either going to use it or I'm not. And then you just lean into it and go. Um, I've pre currently, my my Nautilar list that I've been playing with recently is four drops. Um, that's way too many. Um, but I do retain the ability to flip tide if I see, for instance, like drown men flies. Because I know what drown men flies are wanting to do. Like it's, it's no shock. Like they're, they're not going to sit in their deployment zone. Because that's not what they built the list to do. They built the list to get a pregame move, to then get a movement phase move. And then charge at you and just run you down. So, so let me ask you this one because I think the, the probably the big question that people would have about going down that option 
is it sounds like a really good option, you know, because you've now got to take a Ishran general. So mm-hmm. you, 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 it means that you are not taking an Archelian general or any other, uh, an Eidolon general. Mm-hmm. Now, in most cases, when you talk to someone about IDK, it's the it's the customizable Archelian king on his murder pony that everyone ca- seems to anchor around. Sure. And I know you talked about, you know, not wanting to focus too many resources on that nuclear bomb, but is it worth it? Like, is it actually worth sacrificing the Archelian king, which can be incredibly powerful? It has a lot of great buffs for your army just to flip the tide and turn, uh, to yeah, to take your Ishra and you obviously don't get the customized good stuff or as much customization. Without question, in my opinion. Um, I, I understand the damage that the king does, but killing models doesn't win you games. Scoring victory points wins you games. The king can do a trillion damage. He can he can do Googleplex damage to a unit, but if that damage instance, if that fight phase is not going to lead me towards either A, scoring more victory points than you this round, or B, setting me up so that in the next turn or the next battle round, I'm able to start pulling ahead, then I I just I don't see it. I, I understand and I and I do get it that the, the king is very Lego almost. Like you can build him, you can cut him to fit, salt to taste. I get that. Um that's just not how I see the list and it's not how I've been playing it. And I've been no, doing I, I've been doing okay with it. So you've done incredibly well. And and this is why I'm just challenging you because I, I agree with you. I like the option, but I think when you talk to most people they would look at Unstoppable Fury as a general trait on the Archelian King and the, the the temptation of being under high tide with the plus two attacks and all of this awesome stuff. It's like that's almost too good to give away. And this is why I've gotten John here. And you can listen to Paul if you want to hear a different perspective. And it doesn't mean either of them are right or wrong. It's just a couple of perspectives and you choose the flavor for you. And I think it's a good alternative consideration because, again, most people are just going Achillean King General, put everything under the sun, focus on it. Um, I love your the way, again, you're going towards the scalpel, not the hammer, because I think the Unstoppable Fury Achillean King is more of a hammer build mm-hmm. where you're just going in and trying to like punch somebody in the face. Yeah. I I am, by nature, a more defensive type player. Um, I, I would rather be able to say like, we're going to fight on my terms and the phases as they flow, I like to have some discretion of like how that's occurring. And I think it's because of that, that I like being able to have the power of the opportunity to, or, or excuse me, the possibility of flipping the tides. And that's, that's the reason that I lean towards it. It's just my play style. No, no, no. And I, and I like it. And I like it. I, I love, because I always see deep kin as a scalpel, as you said as well. But the reason it's a scalpel is because you just don't run forward like Iron Jaws and punch someone. It's not like my my daughter's a cane right now, which is a bunch of murder strippers just doing an industrial amount of attacks with high rend. It's about finding the weak point, leveraging your high movement and your high flexibility, whether it's retreat and charge, run and charge, you know, plus one to the charge, all these different things, finding the weak spot in the board and leveraging it, you know, because most armies don't have the speed that Deep can have. The fact that a lot of your units can fly as well gives you a lot of flexibility too. Yeah. No, I agree. Yeah. Cool. Anything else you want to add to that? Or let's get into um, maybe some of your thoughts around the sub factions because I do like them and I think there's a yeah. couple of good options. I'm not going to go maybe as deep as what we did with Paul because I do want to get into your list. But yeah, I don't want to rehash what Paul was saying. I, I, no. I was a big fan of how Paul explained it. Um, I think that the one thing that I will mention is that, and this can be pretty much the, the summary of my enclave analysis. I'm a very big fan of the fact that the Noddle or Monstrous Rampage doesn't care about doesn't care about Hunters of the Heartland because nothing it says says it targets the enemy unit. It's a self target ability. So being able to send a Hunter of the Heartland, like because you can put your own Turtle in Hunters of the Heartland at this point in Noddle because he loses the Behemoth and he gains Battle Line. Being able to have a non-monstrous actionable, that's a word, non-monstrous actionable turtle that can monstrous action himself. It's just, it's very, very consistent. And I really like it. That's the only thing I really will feed onto what Paul had said. Yeah. If you're building a list, are there uh, a couple that really stand out for you right now? Is there, 
is there ones that maybe you would hold back to see how the meta shifts by the way you know i think it's clear james tinsdale is a massive fan of yours absolutely loving your insights so i'm sure he'll catch up later on thanks very much for joining from the uk where are you at with the with the sub factions would you because dom haynes seems to be quite popular at the moment um people love building around the idea of turtles but if you go too heavy on the turtles you really have no points for anything else and i fear what the meta is going to look like when we move away from this monster incentivized um general's handbook because the battle pack might actually just not have those extra monster points so i've uh, i've had this discussion with a few deepkin players as well as the guys here locally before i'm i'm not as high on dom hain because in order for Dom Hain to be offensively good, you have to be getting priority roles. And I, it's, I understand that there's a higher ceiling there in giving yourself the blood to like charge after fighting cut capability, especially in a thrall heavy build. I understand it's there. I get it. But the fact of the matter is, is that like if your opponent does, if your opponent wins priority and doesn't want you to have it, you're not getting it. And that's part of the reason why I haven't drifted towards Dom Hain as much as I thought I would right when the book dropped. Because, of course, uh, I'll be honest, I, I, like many, saw the Dom Hain ability, and I'm just like, well, I don't know who wrote this, but this is nuts. And then I started playing it in practice, and I'm just like, hold on a minute. Like, good opponents will see that, like, you either they're in a defensive position or you're not in a position to capitalize on three redeploys. And they'll be like, go ahead. Like, I'll go first. Like, get, you know, I'm just running at you now. Which is interesting because you've talked a lot about how loving the ability to have flexibility. This just adds another, you know, bunch of flexibility. You get some rules for, for, for going first or going second. Yep. So flexibility in as much, uh, what's, what's a good way to put it? Be, be like water, honestly. Like you, you have the capability, not to quote Bruce Lee here, but like you have the capability in, in Dom Hain specifically in order for you to be capitalizing on the strengths of your list, if you want the Namardi to be able to like run at people, you have to be winning either A, priorities, or B, setting yourself up in a position where your opponent doesn't want to be going second. And when you're at the like the top-down like list building level, at that point of the list building stage, I want like consistencies. I want like guaranteed things. And that's the reason that things like Nautilar or Morphan or Fwethen really to reach out to me because Fwethin to a lesser degree else, Fwethin is really weird because you have to take three individual sharks. You have to play them as if they're a three pack of sharks. And it's just like, I don't get an alpha. If I play with three individual sharks, it just, it yeah. Bad. And you can't, and you can't like, I would like that if I could reinforce them because then yeah. I could have a pack, like I could have three, three sets of two sharks with an yeah, alpha, individuals. you know? Yeah, correct. Correct. I, I, I wouldn't want to take, I wouldn't want to take two sets of the bloodthirsty shiver. Um, that that pro that would probably incentivize me if I could reinforce the bloodthirsty shiver. Yeah, and that see that which you that's can't, really which you can't, folks. Just FYI, just yeah. before you start thinking about it, you can't. Which is what disincentivized me. Yeah. See, and that's that's the reason that Morphan and Nautilar specifically have a lot of allure in my mind, especially with how power powerful and how potent Namardi thralls are right now, as well as Reavers. Being able to say like, okay, well, I'm going to guarantee bring back four Namardi for every soul render that I have in my list to a to a unit. Now, obviously, you can't do it to every unit, but you can do it to a unit. And they increased his range dramatically. It's well, 18 inches now in both both battle shock phases. It's just it's such a consistently good ability now that it brings you so much value and so much redundancy to your thralls, which are the hammer right now. Um, and that's the reason that Morphan has some allure to me. I, I do like Morphan a lot. Um, not a lot I've already established. Um, Ironrack, I know there's a gentleman here in Indianapolis. His name's Jordan. He loves Ironrack. Um, not as big of a fan. Um, I see the allure in it. Um, I do think that if it was just Akel, or not even Akel, not Akelian Heroes, but if cause it's a heroic action, I, I don't really know how you could fix the Ironrack one where it would be just anybody could do it. Um, yeah, but it's just, it's kind of out there. And then Briam Dar is just still struggle busting. I think, um, why? that's rough. Why, 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 why is it struggle? Like what's your, so Bri Briam Dar inherently is wanting to like deep strike stuff off the board edge, um, which is 
fine, um, especially with how they change the, the Soul Scryer in that the guys that come in off the board edge with him don't have to be on the board edge. They can actually be like further up into the board. I, I like the ability in theory, but in practice for you to capitalize on that, you would have to have so many, like you would genuinely have to have like, you'd have two soul render or soul scryers off the board and probably one to two units each with each of them. I mean, that's, we're talking at minimum four at maximum one, two, three, four, six units. I mean, like that's, that's a lot of your army. That's just going to be like off in the nether and good pilots will know that you have to like come in off the board edge and they'll just screen you off the board edge. And then you'll come down in your deployment zone and you've skipped a hero phase, a movement phase. Yeah. If you come down on one, God forbid you come down later. I mean, like, like soul by grave Lords, for instance, if you ran against soul by grave Lords and you're playing Brium Dar, like it's logistically possible. You just don't get anything to come out of deep strike. And, and you that's might absolutely find in, terrifying. And you might find in the upcoming meta, if people are doing more battle line and more options like that, yeah. you might find there'll be less space on the board. Yeah. Early, early third edition where everyone was going monster here, monster hero heavy, and there was just like no troops on the board. Yeah, there was space for days. But now people are going back to screens. They kind of remember, they're like, oh yeah, I kind of need screens. I think Iron Jaws reminded us, oh yeah, we need some screens. Yep. So people started bringing in bodies, some units of fives and tens and you know being able to to block off redeploys and and deep strikes and and coming in from reserve so yeah i think you're almost over investing in that ability um i don't think you quite need it and again with the points going up with idk you have less units to put on the table anyway so you know why would i want to put on half my army or maybe even more than half my army in reserve um it's probably not needed at the moment. Yeah, it's just it's just not quite there for me. But the other ones, like Paul said, I'm I'm a fan of what he how his take on things. So actually, let's let's bring it together, right? Because this is uh, this was from Motor City GT. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and first off, like I want to talk about your list because you are a crack scientist with those Drake Spawn Knights, and I want to unpack a little bit because of allies. Because uh, speak of the devil. Paul Wright, again, uh, is joined the chat. Hey, hey, Paul. Um, we didn't really talk a lot about allies. We didn't talk about, because you've got a really deep, correct me if I'm wrong, Cities of Sigma, Daughters of Cain, Lumeth, Realm Lord, Stormcast, Sylvaneth. Mm -hmm. And Sylvaneth has just gotten a whole bunch of new models. I'm wondering if those Gossamid archers would be a great addition to IDK. Fast-moving archers doing mortal wounds. Might be a little bit expensive for you, but could be a nice touch. But... What's this list all about? So what's it all about? What are you trying yeah. to do? How's it all work? Give me the rundown. Yeah. So the the theory here is that you utilize your two packs of 20 thralls as your primary two hammers and you utilize the Leviathan as your swing. Um, so you you have the more mobile Leviathan that's able to go take out things like Glotkin or Kragnos or the Great Unclean One, Bellacor, the big threat pieces that you don't want to allocate just so many models walking up the board to go deal with. Um, the Reavers obviously, of course, exist because it's 170 points for 20 shots, which will likely be on twos and threes, rend one for one. Um, multiply that by two. I mean, it's just, I mean, Reavers are just so efficient right now. Um, all of the Nomardi are just fantastically efficient, especially under a turtle. And that's, that's really the, it's, it's the weird part about it because I do believe that obje objectively the turtle is overcosted. I, I do think that 500 points is, is a little high for what the turtle does. They took away his impact hits. If you want like the D6 mortal wounds, you can only do it to like one wound models. I mean, it's, they, they changed him for, well, they changed him. I won't say for the worse or for the better, but his points went up, which obviously isn't good. But the thing is, is that it's, it's very difficult, especially when in a list like this, for you to say like, well, the turtle's worth 500 points, end of discussion, because it it's not that cut and dry. Because of like how much coverage he provides you for a plus one to save, for the plus one to hit, for the power piece of being able to say like, well, these are Ren 3 damage for flippers that are coming after you. Like you have this model on the board, which if you could give it a ward save through like a priest, that would probably be better. But even even as it stands, you just have this 16 wound two up model. That's just like you're going to need to deal with this at some point. And, and if your army can't, he's just going to run roughshod through people. Um, yeah. 
so yeah, that's that was the reason that I have Alden and Marty there plus the uh, the light on. Talk to me about your so you've got your uh, thrall master. By the way, give me your thoughts oh. on thrall master. That's the that's the new model. Yeah, man. Um, I I and I do want to unpack you a little bit about so you you know your general, which is the tidecaster. Yeah. Um, I want to unpack your choices under the tidecaster, but tell me more about the thrall master because you definitely got the better end of the stick of that battle box when you look yeah. at the the fire slayer priest versus the thrall master. Leaps and bounds, thrall yeah. master is so good. So why did yeah. you choose it? What is it doing? And when should I consider taking a Thrall Master versus not taking a Thrall Master? I think if you start running more than 10 Thralls, like in packs of 10 Thralls, excuse me, I think that you should definitely give the Thrall Master a look. For one, he's cheap. 110 points is nothing. Um, I mean, he's cheaper than Lotan for that matter. Granted, it's by five points, but cheaper is cheaper. The the power of him comes, and, and it was actually in a game that I played against uh, one of my clubmates. His name was Nick True. Um, I played him round two, as a matter of fact. Um, he was playing Cities of Sigmar, and he brought Fulminators in off the board edge. And I know what Cities of Sigmar do. Like, they're going to pop out of the dark. They're going to shoot you. They're going to move towards you. They're going to charge you, and they're going to try and pull off everything you got. And he had to run into Thralls because that was what I used as my as my screen. And because of how the Thrallmaster does his water bending. And I had him in the boat to have a, a wider coverage area here. The thralls during turn one were plus one to save from being under cover, plus one to save for being under the turtle, had an awe of defense ready, a five up ward save from the boat, and then minus one to be wounded from the thrall master. That will take a stone horn and there will be thralls left. It is just phenomenally powerful being able to say, like, I want to either have exploding sixes, re-rolling ones, or your minus one to wound the Thrallmaster and all Namardi that are wholly within 12 inches of him. He is just such a dynamic power piece. And the thing to bear in mind here is your Thralls aren't limited to one buff. So if you have multiple Thrallmasters, two is probably the most that I would ever recommend. If you have two Thrallmasters under a turtle and Lotan, they are. So let's, let's do it. Let's do some like quick math. So let's say that a pack of blood knights was going out for a, a lovely evening stroll and 20 blind idiots with axes jumped out of the woods at them. Um, that will be 41 attacks at twos and twos, re-rolling ones, exploding sixes, rend one for two damage a piece. Uh, they're going to send them cats back to Nagash so fast it's going to spin their horses' heads. And that's the power. And that's like, and it came into play almost every single game, whether it's offensive with the re rolling, or excuse me, with the exploding sixes, or whether it's defensive with saying, like, I'm minus one to be wounded. Minus one to wound is just such a powerful buff to have because yeah, I just want to hit. I, you've got it everywhere with like, with your heroes, with all out attack. Like, you've got, you've got pluses to hit for days. But pluses to wound, that's tougher. Like, that's a triumph. And when you can just say, like, all of a sudden you're going from fours to wound to fives to wound, or even threes to fours, that's really good. Yeah, I'm, I'm. people know that I'm a Cities of Sigma player, and I will bring in the occasional Frost Phoenix with that minus one to wound bubble. Yeah. And it's so hard to get a plus one to wound, which is why the minus one to wound... My, you know, like I play with goblin idiots with nets, right? And I do minus one to hit. Like what they do, I can get plus one to hit from a lot of sources, yep. but plus one to wound is very difficult. And then if you start laying in, let's say, monsters with a degrading uh, to wound profile because of the damage profile, all of a sudden you can really swing something to go from like hitting on fours or hit, so wounding on fours or threes, you bring in them and they start degrading and then you add the minus one to wound aura that is really powerful it's a very powerful ability and the great thing as well with the fighting stance is it's flexible you choose yep. at the start of the combat phase which ability you wanted to apply it's not a command ability so you can still issue all our attack all our defense any other type of command and yep. as you said it's an aura which means they can receive multiple of them so um absolutely incredible and as an opponent i know that i do not want to get into combat with a full strength unit of thralls i'm chipping away at that unit the whole time because it is a murder blender it, it will hurt you and it got better because it used yeah. to uh get a boost with uh wound characteristic of one or wound characteristic of four yep. now it's gone to three so like what are you doing plus one damage plus one 
is it attack? What's the yeah? What's so the you're one? against chaff. You're at plus one attack, and I against everything from light cavalry on up. You're at plus one to damage. Yeah, so plus one damage from a unit of what twenty thralls. Two attacks each. Like that's brutal. I mean, they'll, they'll run a, a a pack of putrid blight kings or putrid blight, or Pusqua blight lords. Excuse me, Pusqua blight lords. They'll run at blight lords and be okay. And like it's just it's startling how much damage that they do. Do you find the rend though? Like they're only rend one. Don't and care. I know like you why? No. So um when earlier we talked about, for instance, the the factor of math, just like having dice at two damage a pop, all I need you to fail is like four, and things are just like cataclysmically dying very, very quickly. And that's the thing, is like you're gonna roll some ones. Like I'm sorry, like that's just that's probability. Like that's just how it works. Like it, it's Sure. Sometimes somebody will roll, uh, let's say, so we're hitting, so 40, 41 attacks, hitting on twos, re-rolling ones. We're probably hitting with 39 of them and then we're wounding on twos. So we'll say that we're wounding with uh, 30, 30, 32, 33, 32 or 33. You fail four of those, that's eight damage. Like that's already going to pull off at least two blood knights. And that's, that's killing a fly by itself before we start getting it. And I mean, that's, that's absolute bare minimum. Like that's not bad dice. That's not even average. Like that would just be if a four, like just four of them. It's just it's you're, so crazy. You're playing the Daughters of Cain game where you're playing volume of attacks. Yeah. And, and because you can't re-roll ones anymore, you know, sh you are going to roll a bunch of ones. If you're you lucky and, you, and you know, you should be able to get ones and twos. And all of a sudden for every one of those ones or twos, you are doing two damage a pop. So you'll eventually just, just out of sheer numbers. Yep do enough damage which is again why i try to through attrition get to the thralls in combat and and remove that as much as possible like yep. get them down as much as possible is there any way to um to increase the rend on thralls i'm just having a look now uh, at the ability indirectly to um if you have the cast right on you can reduce somebody's save which by extension is increasing rend um okay. so technically yeah, cool. yes I was just thinking, like, again, I'm in my, I'm in my Doors of Cain mode where I can do Drake Ganeth and go from Rend 1 to Rend 2 on the charge. Right. I, I couldn't think of you if you had an equivalent somewhere. But the Tidecaster, I think, for me, like, we talked about the flipping of the tides, which makes sense. We've already spoken about that. But why would you why would you go the Arcane Tome, a universal artifact, over something that's in your book? Um, why not the the second boat? Why yep. not some other type of artifact? I'm just having a look. Yeah, keep, keep going. Um, uh, this is actually you're gonna laugh about this. The reason I didn't take the uh, the ritual, or excuse me, the um, the ship and bottle is because my other boat had snapped off of its base, and I didn't have uh, didn't have any glue to glue it back on. So I literally only had one boat. So I brought an arcane tome instead. Um, it ended up working out pretty well though, because I liked being able to like cast a teleport as well as um, uh, what do you call it? Um, Mystic shield onto the turtle to give him kid to let him ignore that extra pip of rend um or to ignore a pip of rent because he doesn't have uh ancient but it was just honestly just because it was uh i i forgot about when lists were due and <laughs> i was like oh i gotta submit this and so i did um i think in in hindsight i probably would have taken the, the extra boat yeah because i'm just looking at the other options right you know like uh is it dreech leech whatever it is yeah. like minus one to wizards. Minus, yeah no yeah, uh, I'm looking at the brain barnic barnacles. No, <laughs> no, like yeah, like so. It's either like arcane tome. So I think I think you know, getting either um, a, a, an extra spell cast is going to be good, uh, or the boat. I think I can see yep. argument one or the other. Yep. Yeah, one of one of my newer lists uh, is running a warlord because I just said like I'm I'm just going to be like a trillion drops and it has both it has the the boat as well as the arcane tome the arcane tome is on like a is, on, is actually on a thrall master actually um because i wanted to be able to spread out casting so also yeah, because the it. the boat the ship in a bottle has to go on in a share and it can't go on in Akalian, so why why not some of the other heroes like i think is it the soul scry is quite popular at the moment is it the soul scry that's popular at the moment as another oh, soul render. option soul yeah, render the, the soul, soul render. render is the one that brings back models um Honestly, I just, uh, I, I think that the Soul Render has a lot of play in more fans specifically, because like I said, you're bringing back four. 
um, as it stands, if you wanted him to be able to bring back the max of three, you have to be getting him into combat, fighting, killing things. And I just, I wasn't really a fan of the idea of having to use my first combat activation with something like thralls, which obviously are like, you want to hit with thralls first, blow something away and then be like, all right, yeah, you can go with whatever you have left right now. But when you have a, a soul render in the mix and you want him to be able to do what he does at efficiency, like at peak value, well, then you're having to use him to activate first and he'll do like three or four damage. Sure. And then all of a sudden, like whatever you charge is going to be like, well, now I'm just going to like blank your thralls. And then yeah. now all of a sudden we're in a really bad spot. So. No, that's fair. No, that's fair. It's just a curiosity because I yeah. do see it quite popular and, um, it's, it's obviously, I think one thing is a lot of support heroes in IDK. So yeah. choosing the right one, because like, you haven't brought the Archelian King, you haven't brought, there's so many other little minor heroes. Hell, you haven't even brought like the, uh, what are your thoughts on the Underworld's Warband? That's always one that's quite a popular question because I think most people are just craving that an Underworld's Warband is good. And probably there's probably five of them in the game, probably at mm -hmm. best, that are actually usable in match play competitively, folks. If you want to run them because you you want to run the ill-fated, sure. you do you. But yeah. Could, would you run them? You could. Um, it would be tough for me to because um, I would need to buy another one because I took the crab and I put Gotrek on top of it um, so that Gotrek runs at you on a crab because um, I thought that was just absolutely hilarious. That is pretty cool. That actually the, is really cool. The, the counterpoint that I was told at NashCon last year is that he can only move sideways because crabs move sideways. Um, that was not an official ruling, but Griffin told me that, and I was like, "Please don't actually do this to me." You probably deserved it back then. Actually, last year uh, when Got Trek, it was just like running, running right. And I will, I will come to you around like Got Trek as well because like we're going to talk. The, I want to talk about the Drake Spawn Knight. It's yeah. something that is 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 grinding my gears. We haven't talked about it yet, but there's other options. You've got Got Trek as you mentioned, yep. and probably one thing as well is that Got Trek no longer benefits from the sub allegiance, which is one of the benefits of the old book. But you've also got this little spirit of of Gur. You've got the incarnate which I'd be curious to see, would you consider the, the hold, hold that question, but I want to get to the, the, the Drake spawn first. Yeah. So let's talk about some lizards. Um, so so City of Sigmar, cities of Sigmar. They are cities of Sigmar. Um, I, <laughs> I can't actually take full credit for discovering the Drake spawn knights. This was actually, they were found by a friend of mine named Roger Barker. Um, and he asked me, he was just like, what's your screen? And I was just like, uh, 10 thralls. He's like, Hmm. What about Drake Spawn Knights? And I had the exact same reaction that you had when you saw my list. You were just like, what the, what is a Drake Spawn Knight? And then I went and actually looked up the scroll and I was like, hold on a minute. Like these things are actually nuts. So for, for anybody that doesn't know, which should probably be, I don't know, roughly 95% of the listening audience. Just, 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 to, just to errata what you said, I do know what Drake Spawn Knights are. I use them a lot, but I use them in Tempest Eye where I get plus one to their save on the initial charge. And I have a black dragon to combine the command ability to boost them up. Yep. But in your list, I'm like, what the F? Yeah. Why on earth so are they here? Yep. So the reason that they're there is because uh, a handful of reasons. So let's let's start with so let's start with the easy one first, and that's the unit size. So at, at five at five models on ovals, it means that you're able to go through long cohesion. That was one of the big problems that eels faced when we were going into the new book is that they come in packs of three. That means that if you double up and go to a pack of six, you're going to have to play like with the little chevron formations, which is fine in theory, except the volt spears now have one inch range instead of two. And so you lose the ability to reliably get everybody into combat every single time. So when you have these five model units, you're able to string them out and cover a very large amount of your front line, which is great because they have a three plus armor save, which goes down to a two plus with all of defense. And the reason that they're so potent is because while they do not benefit from forgotten nightmares, they gain a benefit of it adversely. So what I mean to say by that is this. So if the Drake Spawn Knights are closer to you, you can't shoot the fish that are further than them because the Drake Spawn are legal targets, which means, according to Forgotten Nightmares, everything past the Drake Spawn that is a Deepkin unit is an illegal target, which means you're going to have to shoot the Drake Spawn first, which means you're going to have to go through a two-up armor save, and that's just a, that's a good screen to have. So to break that down, folks, when you look at Forgotten Nightmares, it says friendly item the Deepkin units can only be picked as the target if they are the closest. And it has nothing to say is that it doesn't mean that your 
allies or your uh, war masters or whatever it might be in the list um, will break that. So it's not like you've got Trek is at the front first. Uh, sorry, not got Trek. It means that, yeah, basically you can only pick the Ideneth units if it's the closest, regardless of what's in front of you. Now, where am I? Going? I'm trying to I'm trying to articulate something, but I can't actually form it. So I'm gonna I'm gonna pass the bow over to you. But sure. yeah, either way, your, your allies, your mercenaries, all of those things are gonna be included. You want to run a mega gargan? It comes in. It, it's included with Forgotten Nightmares. Yep. You you don't always have to shoot the Drake Spawn Knights, but if the Drake Spawn Knights are the closest, you can't shoot anything else. Now, worth noting, if there are Deepkin that are closer to you, you can always shoot the Drake Spawn Knights because, like we said, they don't benefit from Forgotten Nightmares. So if you just have an absolute rage to make sure that I don't have those five screens, and also worth noting, they're two wounds each. So it's 10 wounds on a two plus save, which is pretty okay. If you just have it in you that you are like, you are not going to have those lizards, you can always shoot them if you want to. But if they're closer, you can't shoot anything else. So, yeah, per, yeah, that's basically what I wanted to say. I was trying to articulate, like, you know, if I wanted to have the cron spine and hide it behind a bunch of, I don't know, defensive eels or whatever it might be, and then kind of like turn three, launch it up the board. That doesn't count because it's not a it's not keyword either the deep kin it doesn't gain the keyword so it means it can still be shot but if i yep. want to shoot a deep kin unit um it has to be the closest that's right so i Absolutely dig it correct. i dig it a lot i dig it a lot um because they are a good unit for 125 points they've got a good board size presence when you spread them out um i certainly wouldn't reinforce them i think two nope. units is probably great they're not giving away broken ranks. They're not battle line. They are natively three plus. So with no boosts, if you need a bit of rend on the charge, they get plus one rend to them. So they'll be rend two, but they don't do a lot of damage. They correct, are. Me, correct me if I'm wrong, but they're rend two damage two on the charge. I thought. Correct. Yeah, the lan the lances are rend, yeah. rend two damage like two. So if you like that can them, randomly be some damage. Good objective controllers. They 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 good um, cappers. If you want to get some things to kind of move up the board, and they only move movement ten, so they're not the yeah. fastest cav, but they're tanky. They're actually quite tanky, and they're two wounds a piece as well. So, um, ten wounds in each of those units is not too bad for one hundred twenty five points. Worth noting, fantastic into the mirror, because the th your opponent's thralls will not get the benefit of anything into them because they're two wounds each. Yeah. And, pl and plus, with the hunters, you could you put them in the hunters if you want to, uh, if you want to, yeah. And you know, and even yeah, I wouldn't, but it'd be you know a nice screen that could also ignore you know raw stomp and all that stuff. But I like it. Any other considerations from an ally perspective that you would you'd bring in? I mean, there's chariots, or yeah, are you thinking about like scourge runner chariots are pretty cool. Um, I like the fact that they're like ten points or however many points that they are, um, for as big of a base as you get. Um, I think the problem is actually just like finding some to buy because I, I know that the last time that I saw Scourge Runner Chariots, they were actually kind of like kit bashed with like Fen Region Wolves from 40k. And I was like, this looks badass. And then I was like, wait a minute, what's a skirt? What is a Scourge Runner Chariot? I'm like, I can't even tell you what it is. I converted all mine with using white lion chariots, but that is yep. an expensive ex exercise. You've got like Doomfire Warlocks if you need, if you wanted to get more wizards into the house. They're a little bit more expensive than the Drake Spawn and not really as resilient. But so, if you wanted an alternative, yeah, I actually went to um, my first list coming into uh, the new book. I actually went to uh, I actually went to the cousins first. I went to Lumineth, um, and it kind of blew some people's minds when they saw because my i think it was my indie storm list actually um i allied in a lore seeker um because all of the strengths of the lore seeker are on his scroll they're not necessarily in the lumineth book because he's unique he's not going to be able to take a spell lore and sure you're not going to have aether quartz in uh deepkin but predominantly like the reason that you would take him is because he's 170 points that says like i can like i i being the lore seeker here play the soft side of the board for you and you can say, like, I'll deploy him out of line of sight, barely touching my back objective over here just to, like, block it off. And now all of a sudden, like, you have to say to yourself, like, what do I in, like, to our first conversation that we had, like, what am I going to have to allocate to make sure that this lore seeker is dead and off, or off the objective? And that's that in and of itself is such a really good ability. He's 170 points. The caveat here, of course, is that I'm just kind of like, 
it would be, do you, do you want to run a pack of Reavers or would you rather run a War Seeker? Cause they're both 170 points. And I think as it stands, there's game playing some Lumineth models. Um, but I'm in, in the build that I'm playing personally, it's the Drake spawn for the screen. And another good screen option that um, I always enjoyed as a, um, a daughter's player is the Shadow Stalkers. Yeah. Because they're 150 points now. Um, and what, what I love about them is instead of moving, they can essentially teleport. So they sacrifice their movement. They're a good little screen and they can be keeping up with your bodies. But also it allows me to retreat. And as the game progresses, I can steal objectives. I can, if my opponent, you know, break through a certain area or I need reinforcements, I can just teleport and uh, move them around the board alternatively was, like sorry go on no so the the canine satter shockers were one of the ones that i had originally looked at when i was building list for 3.0 i ended up switching them out for tree revenants because they had the same teleport but it was five models and they were like 80 points and i was, I was like, literally about to go there i was going to say alternatively tree, tree revs rest. or um or your canine shadow not canine shadow, <laughs> your um your canary your heart renders because you've now got the free uh free move after they've shot so i've I've capped a lot of objectives and scored a few extra battle tactics just by being able to automatically drop them from reserve. They're only five models um, shoot, and then they get a free six inch move that gets them onto an objective. Yep. And not talking about the battle. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about the doors that came battle tactic. I'm talking about things like aggressive expansion. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talking about other ones that aren't Daughters of Cain specific know, that are relevant to you. you before the show went live, John was giving me shit about Daughters of Cain and their basically free battle tactics. What about Mega Gargants and uh, Cronspine? Would you consider Cronspine? Uh, definitely no to Cronspine and maybe to Bundo Whalebiter. Um, I think that of the Mega Gargants, I like the Kraken Eaters the most because the ability to kick objectives is probably just really good. Um, this That's anyone uh, you're allowed to any have anyway. Yeah. Order, um, order is only allowed um, Bundo, Bundo. The, the Kraken Eater. The the Kron's bind I'm not quite as sold on because nobody can retreat when you're in domination, like within domination range of him. And this past weekend, we had a GT in Knoxville, and I played a gentleman round four, so first round of day two, um, and he moved. He was playing um, Bone Splitters, I, Ice Bone, actually. Had all the pigs, Kragnos, Incarnate. He was, like, ready to rock and roll. He moved everything up. I shot his general, and then Kragnos and – um, the Cronspine sat there until the heat death of the universe. And we all just kind of like cried for a minute because it's, that's 1160 points of your army. That's literally not going to do anything for the rest of the game. Yeah. It, look, it's a great, it's a great unit. And I, I'm a big fan of it, you know, to, to tie it to say the tide caster for the plus one to cast, mm -hmm. you know, having something really offensive is, is quite helpful, but it is a big chunk of points. So you'd have to be dropping your turtle or finding some points somewhere, which your army is quite expensive. So it do is. you have 400 points to pull from? Um, probably the answer is no right now. No, right now. The, the caveat to the plus one to cast for the tide caster is that the the question then becomes like what do you want to cast at plus one like your spell like the spell lore that she has access to isn't really that great i think if you if you were going to like if, if somebody came up to me and they were like john i, I want to play a cron spine and deepkin and i was just like i'd advise you don't i don't care i want to play a cron spine and deepkin i'd be like all right cool play it with an eidolon because when you have the eidolon of the sea She's not named, and so you can bind the cron spine to her. So now she's going to be re-rolling with plus one to cast, and her scroll spells are kind of bananas, actually. Like, being able to make something, like, potentially minus three to their armor save in melee, that's just really good. I mean, like, that can turn somebody off very, very quickly. I think um, what also work, work really well, I was thinking, is um, if it was based around, is it Futhan with the sharks? Yeah. Um, because you know you, it gives you know, if you do all that attack with the cron spine it gives it as a bubble getting all of your sharkies on a, a two to hit um could be quite tasty if yeah. you're building that way because they, it would keep up with the speed right yeah they they receive plus one to hit natively from the king except for the mounts i think um so the riders would be getting plus one to hit from um like i think it's like akelian lords or something i can't remember what the ability name is but yeah, that's that's true. If you all attack the cron spine, the, the sharks themselves would get it as well. So yeah, that's that's, that's what I'm thinking. Like you, like when I play with cron spine, I want something to to go with cron spine. Whether sure. it's my mega gargants, whether it's Morathi, whether it's something that can go up the board. 
Um, thralls might be a little bit harder, but I think then the caveat, and, and I think the other thing as well is with thralls, um, if the Cronspine dies, then it's locked in and essentially going to be um, in combat, where at least sharks are a little bit easier to get out of that range. All right. Yeah, the the whole like you're just nobody gets to retreat. Like that's that can just be such a such a dangerous ability because if you're not careful, like if if you deploy within or if you're within three, I mean, like it's going to just start eating your own models. And I mean, it's like like it's that's just such a weird position to be in. What what is some of your favorite um, combinations with with IDK? I'm just stalling you for a second while I bring up your deployment. Actually, here you go. I wanted to bring this up. Actually, I'm going to bring up a, a picture of your deployment because. One thing that uh, often gets asked is, how do I deploy? What's a good way to deploy? Sure. So I brought up an example here of your one of your IRL um, deployments. Can you mm -hmm. talk to me a little bit more about good deployment tactics or advice? Yeah. So this was round one of uh, the Michigan GT. Uh, or excuse me, not Michigan GT. That's later this year, and that was the one last year. Uh, this was round one at Motor City. Um, seeing that I was going to be playing against Plague Drones and... Um, the all fly list meant, well, by and large, he's got, I think it was Epidemius in the backfield. By and large, I understood like what he was going to be trying to do. And so the question that I presented him was when you move and then you get your additional move, which is where he is right now, you're now being presented with a bunch of like eight, nine, 10 inch charges. And the question is, if you get in, congratulations, but I don't suspect. And I also don't think just based on how probable or not problems, excuse me, probability works that you're going to be able to roll tens with like everything so if you do get in with somebody it's not going to be everybody and if you don't get in with everybody then i'm able to kind of piecemeal deal with your deal with your flies because that's that's the best way for you to adequately deal with a, a list like this is being able to say like i'm going to pull off a piece of you here i'm going to pull off a piece of you here and now that you're in a, a weaker position i can push off the rest of your army um, in terms of the raw deployment, if what you'll see right right there in front of you is Lotan is in the boat. Um, he's providing the plus one to wound aura for every uh, for all the deepkin that are around him. The other reason for that is because I wanted if they did choose to charge, that they would be going into what is effectively going to be a three plus five plus with a redundant uh, plus one uh, from the cover. Um, so it would just be a very hard way to, or excuse me, it would be very difficult to crack all the way through low tan right there. Um, and then obviously, of course, he would have all out defense as well. Um, obviously, they're going to be fishing for uh, disease points, but yeah. low tan has a ward save for that as well. And that's just kind of what, that's the reason that we bring him. So you've, you've kind of like in a defensive mindset, you've hugged the, uh, the, the gloom tide shipwrecks. Mm -hmm. So you're able to, again, if they're going to be offensive and try to get to you, You've got the ward save to protect your Nomati units. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, talk to your TO on how they rule uh, Lotan and the companion in regards to the Gloom Tide and and the eligibility. I think it, uh, I personally would probably rule it's okay, but uh, it feels like it's a, one of those weird nuances. But yeah. you know, your you, your turtle very much is the protector to kind of make sure that everyone can get the plus one or as many can get the plus one to their save or treat it as cover. Um, and then I've got the other choice, which is um, from this is a TTS game that you you were practicing. You know, mm -hmm. similar concepts, but you've executed them a little bit differently given the way the deployment map kind of set up. Um, what we what's your thinking here? You being in the red, by the way. This was a shoot heavy list. Um, yeah, so I was on the red, and my opponent was um, playing Blades of Corn on blue. Um, I apologize, to everybody. I wish I could have found a more meta matchup for a screenshot, but unfortunately, I just didn't have it. Um, the, the reason that I'm set up in the way that I am is because we have, um, three packs of Reavers as well as a pack of three sharks, which is the primary hammer. And then a pack of two sharks down there to your right, right inside of the, uh, right inside of the terrain. Predominantly what we're looking to do with a list like this is play very much at arm's length. Like we're, we're not looking to over engage. We're looking to measure. Um, and I did have priority here to, to determine who was going first. And I was obviously going to make him go first. What you're looking to do is measure exactly where you need to be for you to get everyone in to be able to either a shoot or charge um the three sharks of course are not going to be going into combat until either it's ideal for them or we're in high tide um, but when they do kind of like to your point about the cron um they're going to be going in with the king um, because when the king raises the banner and gives somebody high tide for free 
they will fight at the start of the combat phase, and then you will still get your primary activation um, as if, or excuse me, as it's your turn. So even if you roll a one for um, Lord of Tides, you're still going to get two combat activations before your opponent will get one, which is a very powerful ability. Um, the did you, did there, you go for all? Did you go for all three of those objectives? By the way, or uh, would you? No, did you go for two actually, of the three, or no? That's actually a really good point. Um, so going for all three objectives, unless I think it's tectonic, which has the alpha and the beta objectives, there, there's not really a whole lot of logic in trying to spread yourself out for three objectives because when you're scoring victory points, it doesn't actually check for three. It doesn't care. It just says one, two, or more. If I have more, then there's no reason for me to allocate myself and spread myself thinner to go to a third objective. Now, in the event that we're going towards like battle round three with um, uh, with the, the burning the objective, yeah, we, 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 yeah. Uh, at that point, then maybe we can look at you know diversifying where we are. But as it stands, normally I'm just going to try and go for two objectives and just hold those and kind of use that as my mobile base of operations, if you will. Yeah, no, I, I, you, you're hundred percent right. There's no re it's not AOS two where you gain a whole bunch of battle tactics based or victory points based off you know the amount of, that you've got. For Absolutely. most of them, it's one, two, and more. And having two of three or four or five or whatever it works out to be is more. So it's enough. And yeah. the benefit as well for TikTok interference, should that consist uh, con continue in in the, the next edition or next general's handbook, is that um, you've got the speed. You've got the speed that if, you know, should that center point objective be burnt in that example, then you've got the speed to kind of move on to the other and, and, and chase it while some other armies are just like foot slogging it and it can be too late. It can be too too hard to, to get that other objective. Yeah, I think I think that map was First Blood, um, which does have uh, non-prime objectives. I do think that Tectonic sp specifically is prime objectives, which means that with Tectonic, they would all be sticking around. But to, to your point, you're right. When when somebody burns like a middle objective, for instance, and then they're saying like, we're going to fight on two sides of the board, like you need to be ready to be able to move over there. And if you can't, then you're in a bad I've won, I've I've won games off armies just purely by burning the center objective they control and their army is so slow that they can't get to the other objective. And I can. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a great strength of yours. Um, is there any... In any other like combinations or any, I guess, keys to victory. If I'm thinking about being a Deepkin player and you have done a, such a great job in the competitive scene for a long period of time and you've shared such great, you know, wisdom. Thank you so much, John. Is how do I become successful in the in the current book? And are you thinking differently now that we've got Night Haunt? Now that we've got daughters. We have potentially what Skaven, and we've had some today, we've had some leaks and some um some previews of what skaven might look like um are you thinking differently at all yeah i think um depending on how daughter shakes out uh, is really going to determine whether or not i actually change my list or likely change armies um we can talk about that in a bit because that's a spoiler for some people <laughs> not on the deepkin show we don't talk about changing armies you're, right. you're a long-term like you're a long-term deepkin player continue yeah. um it would really depend on whether or not two wound models start becoming really rampant. Um, because if two wound models just become the status quo, then my thralls just aren't as good. And if my thralls aren't as good, then I'm just not going to run thralls. And if I'm not running thralls, then that means I'm either going to A, run reavers or B, run like something very different else. Um, because the, the strength of thralls is being able to say like, I'm better against chaff and I'm better against heavy units. Um, and when you're right in between, like in the thick middle with um, Hearthguard Berserkers or Blood Sisters, like none of it feels really good, Espe especially so if, for instance, like Daughters of Cain have the heart, I think it's what is it, Heart of Fury? Um, the yeah, prayer the Heart of Fury, we were, yeah, the endless um, prayer. That's, yeah, that yeah. thing is fantastic prayer. And it went down in points. Yeah, it's, so Sorry. regardless, regardless, um, advice, I have kind of grown on the whole, like, just be a filthy spike and just blow people out of the water. And my evaluations kind of changed. Um, and I'm sure I'm going to get made fun of on Sunday for this, but here's, here's my honest take. Um, if you don't enjoy, like actually enjoy the army that you're playing, 
you're not going to have as much fun with it. And if you're not going to have fun with it and you're not enjoying it, you're not going to play it. I play Deepkin because in their lore, I, I, I level set with some of the things like in their story, like their creation, like their rebellion against Teclas. Like there, there are things in this book that when you actually like kind of zoom out and change Teclas for aspects of religion that I'm like, Oh, well, this is awkward. And it's that combined with the fact that I do just kind of have, I don't Some people will say an obsession I, I do like uh, ocean life. Um, I do like the ocean. I like animals and being able to play an army that I have a giant turtle is just fun for me. I, whether or not it's great. I, I don't know. 500 points of literally anything except turtles is probably mathematically better, but I like my turtle. So I'm going to play my turtle. Um, and people, people have heard this on my channel again and again and again. It's about the rule of cool. It's about yeah. finding the thing that you enjoy. Um, we were talking before the stream started, and um, I'm really excited about Daughters right now. And part of the reason is, is that when I picked up this army, it was my Armies on Parade army, and um, that was last year. And then Australia went into lo heavy lockdown. I, was, I literally couldn't play a game for four and a half months. I finally come out of lockdown and I played Daughters of Cain with my witch elves. The things that I painted like 60 to 80 of these witch elves in early book, they were trash. They did absolutely nothing. Now, and I, and I shelved them. I put them on the shelf. I didn't touch them for ages. Now that they're good, I've come back to them. Not because they're overpowered. It's because that's what drew me to the army and I didn't want to play snakes. Yeah. The easy answer was go buy snakes, play snakes. I didn't enjoy snakes. I didn't go down snakes. I went back to gargants and gits, which is the things that I probably more enjoyed. So I echo your statement, and I think follow the rule of cool. If you want to run all the sharks and you want to paint them like street sharks, go do it. But then, you know, and I think um, there's a, a big lesson here. But at the same time, like, you are in a really good competitive spot. You can build some competitive lists, whether you love thralls and reavers, whether you love sharks and turtles and eels. There is something for you here. You may not go 5-0, and oh, but you've got the tools to be able to be competitive and win more games than you lose, yeah. no matter what you build. Yeah. No, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Yeah. Cool. Um, any final keys to your success? How do I become a better Deepkin player other than everything you've said? Like, what's your closing thought? Um, closing thoughts, closing thoughts. I think that the book got better. Um, I think that the, the team addressed a lot of the shortcomings in the previous book. Um, I do think that if somebody picked up Deepkin right now and started playing it, um, I think that they would thoroughly enjoy it because they're not going to be, frankly, tainted by the memory of 27 Morsar Guard. Um, and because of that, I think that they'll have a, a really fun time. Um, there's a lot to do with the book. Like we said, or like, like you said, excuse me, is that you can... Like you can pretty much just flip this book open, point to a scroll, and you can probably play it and go X1 or X2. Um, the exclusion, of course, is the eels, just because I, I do think that eels are kind of shelf status, which they should be because they ran rampant for like four years. So Yeah, you know. we, we, it's time for them to kick back a little bit. Yeah. I, all right, I've got two more questions. I've got two, two final things. One, being a fish person and you love your aquatics, if you could add one thing to Idna Deepkin, a Battle new otters. creature, otters. Battle otters. Yes. Uh, I'll tell you this. Somebody told me, and I'm not going to say who it was, but if they see this, they'll know who they are. You know who you are. They said that the uh, the river tribe for Lumineth was going to be elves riding, riding otters. And they said it because they know that I would absolutely drop everything and play literally nothing but an entire army of otters. Uh, yeah. Battle otters, man. Uh, they, I don't need shooting. Don't give me shooting. Just give me like a sword and board on otters. Four, three plus, four plus save. I'm good. I I'll, I'll play it. I don't care if I go like X and three. I'll I'll play it out. You know, I'd, you know, it'd be cool. I, like obviously, one. I've said this a few times. I'd love like a kraken or some type of big monster, like a like a, a combat monster. Sure. The other the other one is I wonder if you have like your version of goblins. You know, like there's a horde of idiots where there's like penguins, whether it's some type of. <laughs> I don't know, like, like maybe like swarms. Like, I don't know if back in the the ye old days of fantasy battles, you used to have like those swarms of creature, like swarms of crabs or swarms of, I don't know, something. But you know, like almost like a spirit host base, but your version of a swarm. I don't that know. Was, that, that would 
Uh, that was what I used as Aether Wings, actually, was the bits off of a Gloomtide shipwreck, and I just like registered them as Aether Fish. And everyone's like, what's an Aether Fish? And I'll be like, it's an Aether Wing. And they're like, oh, that makes sense. And I'm like, yeah, all right, cool, thanks. All right, any shout-outs? Uh, yeah, thanks to um, thanks to my club, um, Indy. Love you guys. I'm super supportive. Um, thanks to my family, my wife. Um, tomorrow's my mom's birthday. Um, so happy birthday, Mom. I'm sorry I can't get down to Tennessee. I wish I could. Um, what's mom's name bonnie bonnie anderson happy birthday bonnie um and yeah club family make family proud make old proud yeah that's that's my goals for this year oh and if anybody's wondering for small text always be presenting your opponent with two bad decisions and you let them pick one that was said by abraham lincoln in i don't know just pick a year that's not C. That doesn't. That's not a C. Like hey, hey, woe says always be charging, and I can accept that one. Yeah, but always be I, 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 It's not A B P. Nah, I like A B C. <laughs> always be and Michelle talking math land. She's obviously a massive fan. But John, you are an absolute legend. Um, thank you so much for all the insights. I think between this discussion and the discussion I have with Paul Wright, I hope you all have some interesting thoughts. Some things you'll agree with John with. Some things you'll be like, oh, I think he's been smoking some of that ether C, and you know maybe I want to go back to my Achillean King. Whatever it is, you've got a couple of different options. None of it is is absolute truth. It's personal preference. So find the spot in the hobby that you want to play with and um, let me know in the comments what your thoughts are. And is there anything that we didn't discuss? Maybe some other, in particular, like allies. Is there any other allies? Like are Aether Wings actually worthwhile? You know, like we used to run them back in the day. I know they went to 65 points and, you know, they probably got a little bit too expensive. But is there endless spells that we like to bring now that we're a little bit better at magic? Um any thoughts around things like, you know, the Eidolons? Either way, you know, let me know in the comments. John, you're an absolute legend. Thank you so much. And you're on Twitter as well. Um, your Twitter handle is? Uh, 33R2D2. It's the old profile for Eels on the Charge. <laughs> I'll, I'll link it in the show a little bit later after it kind of renders on YouTube. But, um, John, thank you again. Eel, Elon Musk, not thank Elon you. Musk, Eel, Elon Musk. Um, go, go give him a follow absolute legend and a lot of great insights. Thank you again. And let's wrap this up. Thanks Peace out. Thanks for sticking around until the end. I hope you found that video interesting and you walked away with a few new ideas. If you did, I would appreciate it. If you hit like on the video, as well as left me a comment, let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below. The conversation will continue over on Discord, so links down below in the episode description if you want to join the Discord and continue the Age of Sigmar conversation. I want to give a massive shout out as well to these absolute bloody legends, these champions who have continued to support me through Patreon or YouTube members. That is going directly into supporting the maintenance and the growth of this channel. So thank you very much, guys. Much appreciated. And until next time, roll more sixes.